let's start with our fiction bestsellers. And right off the bat, we got our Patterson Thriller for the month. Uh, from March, he partnered up, partnered, partnered up with Dolly Parton. Um, and you will not be surprised by the plot at all. A rising star in the country music world um, is running from her past. CJ Box has a new mystery in the Joe Pickett series. It is number 22. Uh, the Match, the second in the Wild series, is a new thriller from Harlan Coben. Janet Ivanovich is starting a new mystery series uh, starring Gabrielle Rose, and it will include her typical quirky characters. A Sunlit Weapon is number 17 in the Maisie Dobbs mystery series. Stuart Woods has a new thriller, number 61 in his Stone Barrington series. Kate Quinn uh, has a standalone historical novel based upon a true story of a librarian uh, who became a deadly spy during World War II, as you could guess. <laughs> and then last but not least, Lisa Scottolini has a new standalone thriller about the Bennett family who uh, unfortunately encounters some carjackers and thing goes, things go awry from there. And then for our nonfiction, um, Abundance is a Guide to Success and Wellness in Your Life. Uh, Eli Mustel applies his legal expertise to the Constitution and Allow Me to Retort. Margaret Atwood has a collection of essays out. Megan O'Rourke takes a deep dive into the world of chronic illness and auto autoimmune disease. Um, and she includes her own story within here. Uh, this month's COVID book is by Daniel Ward, and he takes a look at the history <coughs> of the disease, so not just COVID-19, but clear back to SARS and beyond. Uh, Gary White and Matt Damien share with us how they are tackling access to potable water for everyone. Uh, Maria Yonovich tells us about her time as a diplomat in Ukraine. And then last is a, again, a World War II story uh, that combines a mother's personal account of being in a camp uh, with her daughter's research. All right, into the thrillers. And okay, we're going to start off with a thriller by Erica Ferencik, and the title is Girl in Ice. And um, as you might imagine, it involves a girl in ice. <laughs> um, <laughs> reviewer A.J. Banner says it's a dark, suspenseful, visceral thriller that combines the pressing issue of our time, human destruction of the environment, with a gripping and beautifully written mystery set in the frigid far reaches of the Arctic Circle. Valerie Chesterfield is our protagonist, and she's a linguist who specializes in dead Norse languages, <laughs> and, or Nordic languages, I'm sorry. And at the beginning of the story, she is grieving for her brother, who is, was reported to commit suicide, but she has suspicions otherwise. They're gonna play out later on in the story. Um, she receives a contact from her brother's fellow researcher, Wyatt. Wyatt tells her, that he needs help with a young girl who is sick and maybe dying. She's speaking a language that no one understands, and she has been frozen in ice for who knows how long, and she's re recently been thawed. And she's alive, and she has something important to say, but no one can understand what it is. So Val Valerie goes to help out Wyatt um, in the fierce Arctic landscape, she realizes she must discover the truth about the enigmatic Wyatt and his research if she's gonna save the girl. And maybe when she finds all that out, it will reveal what actually happened to her brother. Um, if you enjoy uniquely imagined stories of suspense with unforgettable settings that keep you riveted from beginning to end, you just might enjoy this one. And as read alike, I chose um, Lincoln Child because it, it terminal freeze, and of course it's going to be a read alike. <laughs> I don't read Lincoln Child, I'm not sure, but. Oh, and, I like that. Do you? Yeah. Uh, and Into the Jungle is a previous uh, story by the same author, if you want to get a little warmed up to the author. And 
this is a, um, a young woman's excursion into Bolivia. This one comes out on the 1st of March. Yes, me. It's a book I read a few years ago called The Curiosity, which is currently on the barely moving shelves at St. Vincent's in the fiction section. Really? I can't remember the author, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. The same thing, there was a, a man frozen in ice that has, that they have thought out, and, and he has survived and he can speak, and what. it's kind of interesting. It's kind of interesting. It was something interesting. Yeah, and there's also a book, I think, that's called The Girl in the Ice, um, which caused me some confusion. For a moment, a one small, brief moment in time, I thought I was going to have to call Megan and say, hey, girl, you got that all wrong. But I didn't. All the problems with articles. Got here the night shift by Alex Finley. So New Year's Eve 1999 in Linden, New Jersey. Four teenage girls are attacked while working the night shift at Blockbuster Video. Only one girl survives. The primary suspect disappears. Fifteen years later, four teenage girls are attacked while working the night shift at an ice cream parlor in the same town. Only one girl survives. The survivor of the first crime is now a therapist and is asked to help the survivor of the copycat crime, thereby reliving her own traumatic experience. Uh, other characters include the brother of the original suspect, who thinks that he was falsely accused, and also the investigating FBI agent. Uh, from the publisher, Twisty, Poignant, and Redemptive, The Night Shift is a story about the legacy of trauma and how the broken can come out on the other side. Uh, Finley, this is his second book. He debuted with a thriller last year uh, that received high praise called Every Last Fear. Uh, some read-alikes, we have The Sorority Murder by Allison Brennan. So this is about a guy who was obsessed with an unsolved murder on a college campus. And a few years after the crime, he starts a podcast dedicated to the subject. So we have Unsolved Murder, same thing with the twisty plot, suspense. Uh, then also The Whisper Man by Alex North. This is about a father and a son living in a town with a dark past that resurfaces. Um, so similarities would be characters who are forced to reckon with trauma, a traumatic past, and also copycat, copycat killer. To say we've got a new face with us today, but I'm gonna guess that you figured it out that it was Patrick, and that you even probably figured out his name from the slide you know, process of elimination. So, welcome, Patrick. <laughs> um, after a nine year break, John Searless is back with a psychological suspense novel. At its heart, The Last Affair is about the lengths lonely, isolated people go to for love and connection, only to find something darker. The main characters are three seemingly strangers, Skyla, a recent widow living next to a drive-in movie theater that she ran with her husband for 50 years, her husband has passed away, Teddy, a charming Briton, and Skyla's new tenant in Jeremy, an unhappy writer living in New York City who's on his way to Providence to review a new restaurant. You may wonder how the three points of view, views will converge into one. And there is a twist that you may not see coming. This is an engaging, character-driven plot. Um, and then, though this is not technically a suspense, Lane Moriarty's Truly Madly Guilty has the same feel to it. You're following the story of three couples to an explosive conclusion that you will, you know, keeps you guessing. And then we do have earlier works of John's as well. I happen to pull uh, Help for the Haunted. It's about a daughter's search for the truth of the, about the death of her parents. Um, everybody's favorite category, <laughs> science fiction. Tell me an ending by Joe Harking. What would the world be like if we had the power to delete our memories? Tell Me an Ending is a dystopian tale about a tech company that can do just that, erase memories. So the story follows four characters, each of whom have to grapple with what to remember and what to forget. We have an Irish architect, a college dropout, 
former policeman and one young man with almost no memories at all. And then involved in all of her lives is the psychologist who works at the memory removal clinic uh, and who begins wondering about the, ethic, the ethics of the business. Uh, so this has been described as provocative, smart, thought-provoking. This is uh, Hart Gang's debut uh, for a read-alike epic recursion by Blake Crouch. Um, in this book, a detective investigates uh, what appears to be a memory-altering disease. Uh, people are experiencing memories of past lives, uh, and uh, some, some are being driven to suicide as a result. So obviously, some similar themes, themes of exploring memory and what it means. Uh, on a similar note, we have Faller by Will McIntosh. Uh, in this book, no one remembers anything about their past lives. Uh, and the main character is on a mission to find a woman that he only knows from a photo in his pocket. So, a couple more sci-fi books about memory. That was Baldi, which, um, I don't know if you guys came to it, but he was our 2019 Speaking Volumes author. Mm -hmm. um, so his latest in the science fiction realm is the Kiju Preservation Society. I'm probably mispronouncing that. Um, it imagines a world where in one dimension, giant dinosaur-like creatures, think Godzilla and King Kong exist, and then a group in our dimension supervises travel between the parallel Earths and you know prevents mishaps. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> this is a wonderful mismatch of the Japanese, again, kaiju film genre, Pacific Rim and Jurassic Park, and references to these films are sprinkled throughout. Um, looking at this from a broader context, it is also commentary on billionaire culture and the most recent past political environment. Um, the monsters may not be the truly evil ones, however, there is a sense of optimism as uh, people band together for the collective good. As you would expect from any Scalzi novel, it is full of witty banter and snarky humor. Uh, this book is reminiscent of his earlier writing style in The Agent of the Stars and The Android's Dream. Um, so The Agent of the Stars here on the end, um, it's about aliens coming to Earth to establish the first interstellar uh, friendship. And then Android's Dream, uh, which is about the chaos that ensues after a human diplomat kills his alien counterpart. Um, so if you would like a non scalzy book to read while you're waiting, uh, I suggest Terry Pratchett's uh, The Long Earth that is still that is also about parallel Earths, but it doesn't include any of the monsters in there. And so I've got okay. The Tobacco Wives. It does take place 1946. Brightleaf, North Carolina, which at the time is the tobacco capital of the South. Maddie Sykes is a skilled seamstress who moves to Brightleaf at the end of the war. She joins her auntie's prosperous dressmaking business. And Bright Leaf is like a wonderland. After all the rationing and shortages with, and with the, all the glamor of Southern society, Maddie meets women of many kinds, from glossy tobacco executive wives to factory work workers, and she forms strong bonds with many of these women. She begins to notice, however, that they disproportionately seem to have health problems, including substantial health problems. Coincidence? Hmm. Uh, Maddie thinks so until she inadvertently uncovers some evidence that tells her otherwise. The characters are believable, believable with a lush setting and storytelling that is rich in pith Pitch, perfect dialogue and detail. Uh, that's a quote from author Kristen Harmel. Um, sheds light on the hidden history of women's activism during the post-war period. At its heart, The Tobacco Wives is a deeply human, emotionally satisfying and dramatic novel about the power of female connection and the importance of seeking truth. So this is Adele Meyer's debut novel um, it will be available on March 1st, and some read-alikes, The Book Woman of Troublesome Creek. Once again, I probably picked one most of us have read, but 
um, an unusual woman with an unusual background uh, jumps out into a, a public position and, um, you know, she's blue and the world doesn't understand. And um, also, when the men were gone, um, this is, uh, of course, how women jumped in and took over uh, many positions in factories and businesses during World War II and how that planted the roots of feminism that really uh, grew a couple decades later. Okay. Booth by Karen Joy Fowler. So Booth is a story about the family of John Wilkes Booth, who was, of course, Lincoln's assassin. Uh, although he is the most famous of the Booths, John is not actually the primary focus of this book. Uh, the reader is introduced the, to the entire Booth family, and it is from three of the other nine siblings' perspectives that the, that the story is told. So Junius Booth is the patriarch, emigrates from England to Maryland, and has ten children with his wife on their farm. Uh, he is a talented Shakespearean actor, uh, but is also unstable and a heavy drinker. The Booth family, though, they come to be known as one of the country's leading theatrical families, uh, many of them following in their father's acting footsteps. So really this book is a family drama set during a tumultuous time in America's history. So we have complex characters, uh, historically rigorous writing by the author. Uh, Fowler was a Man Booker finalist for her book, We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, which came out in 2013. Some read alikes. Uh, first, we have Lincoln by Gore Vidal, which is a historical fiction novel about Lincoln that spans the Civil War. Uh, obviously, same period of American history, connected historical figures. And then uh, Carolina Built by Kiana Alexander. This is another new book, which is why it's just on paper here, coming soon. This is about Josephine Leary, a black woman who became a real estate businesswoman after North Carolina's emancipation in 1865. Uh, James is better known for his Grandchester mystery series. Um, and in his latest, The Great Passion, he takes us back to 1723, when a young Stephen is sent to the choir school of St. Thomas Church by his father to study music so he may one day join the family business of repairing church organs. And Jane imagines that Stephen gets to witness the creation of Bach's St. Matthew Passion in 1727. Because Stephen is bullied at school, Bach welcomes him into his family. Those through Stefan, we, we get to experience what life is like in 18th century Germany and in Bach's household, where creativity, music, and a deep faith in God reign. This is a rich, richly detailed story. Um, those that enjoy music will take pleasure in James's knowledge of music history and the technical detail that he provides. Um, if you would like another fiction work about Bach, you can try um, After the Fire. Uh, which is by Laura Belfry, which traces a lost manuscript from Box from the 18th century Berlin to modern day New York. And then for a slight change of pace, Laura LeBow's Sent to the Devil is a mystery where the protagonist is working with Mozart on an opera. That's part of it. All right, into literary fiction. I've got the first one. Here's our COVID-19 fiction entry for the month. So, The Fall by um, Sarah Moss takes place in England during a COVID pandemic lockdown over just one night. Kate, needing to get out of the house, we've all been there, takes a walk up the hill, <clears throat> walk up to the hills, leaving her teenage son and her cell phone behind. Though quite familiar with the area, she falls. Her son panics when she doesn't return and contacts their neighbor and eventually the police because of course they're in lockdown and they should not be out of their house. This story weaves together four narratives, Kate's, her son's, the neighbor's, and one of the searchers. Um, as one reviewer for Kirkus stated, the portrait of humans and their neighboring wild creatures in our natural landscape in their, and in their altered world is darkly humorous, arrestingly honest, and intensely lyrical. Um, if you want more COVID, 
literature fiction, uh, you can try out Our Country Friends, which is about a group of friends that are waiting out the pandemic in a country house. And of course, being stuck in a place together means all kinds of things can happen. Um, and then there's also Luce, uh, Louise Erdrich, The Sentence, which is about her bookstore and many apps. Okay. Cartographers by Peng Shepard. Uh, Nell Young is the daughter of a cartographer and has a similar passion for maps. When her father is found dead in a New York public library, he has in his possession an old, cheap gas station map. The same map that he had inexplicably blown up on her about in an argument they had years ago. So Nell soon discovers that there is more to this map than first meets the eye, and it starts her down a path into her family's dark history. So this is uh, an imaginative and magical novel. This is Shepard's second novel. She also wrote a book called The Book of M in 2018. So for read-alikes, Cartographer's Secret. They both have cartographer in the title, right? Uh, so this is, a, this is an historical mystery about a woman who discovers a map that might hold the answers to her aunt's disappearance. So similar themes of maps, family secrets. There's also a, a father-daughter dynamic going on in this one. And then I also picked The Clockmaker, the Clockmaker's Daughter by Kate Morton, which is about a fem female archivist who discovers an old sketch of a country manor that bears resemblance to one that her mother used to tell her magical stories about. So again, mysterious artifacts, secrets, mystery, and magic. By Susan, is it by, yes, by Susan Strait. Um, this takes place in current time. It takes place in California. And we find our prota protagonist, Johnny Frias. Um, he has California in his blood. He's a descendant of the state's indigenous people and Mexican settlers. He works in as a state highway patrol officer, but he's haunted by a 20-year-old shooting from his rookie year. And a chain of connections to this event unites the complex cast of characters in unusual and unforeseen ways. This is an unforgettable American epic examining race, history, family, and destiny through the interlocking stories of a group of native Californians. With sensitivity, Strait captures California in all its injustice, history, and glory, and she tells the story of the American West through the eyes of the people who built it. Um, she also wrote a biography in the company of women, in the, I'm sorry, in the country of women, and uh, it, it, once again, in Southern California, how they, the uh, families, uh, she brings, she, she names her own family. She identifies with people. Um, uh, uh, on her own as, as their fam as her family, and Annie Pearl, uh, who gave us, of course, broke back mountain. Uh, read a light from her would be the shipping news. It's another American family saga. All right, into women's fiction. Rebecca Searle's latest One Italian Summer is great for armchair travelers because there are detailed descriptions of the food and the beautiful Italian coast. Um, and it is a moving story about the bond between mother and daughter and the exploration of how we pick the life we want. For Katie, her mom Carol is her best friend and her first phone call with happy or sad news. Just before Katie and Carol are traveled to Italy, where Carol spent a summer before meeting Katie's dad, Carol passes away. Heartbroken and grieving, grieving, Katie decides to take the trip anyway. And she meets another Carol, who reminds her so much of her mother. Is she? If you enjoyed Faye Faraway by Helen Fisher, um, which is about a woman who travels back in time to be with her mother, who she lost at a young age, then you might also like um, One Italian Summer. And then I also pulled an earlier work from Rebecca. Um, I have the dinner list. This is from 2018. And it's about if you just had one night where you could have anybody living or dead at your dinner table, what would that look like? I've seen a lot of head nods, so 
Well, you must have read that one. Smile and Look Pretty, Amanda Pellegrino's debut. Um, this is like nine to five for the Instagram generation. <laughs> Four best friends are overworked and underpaid. They decide enough is enough and they start a blog. And the blog uh, documents the uh, abuses that they suffer uh, at the hands of their bosses in their workplace. Uh, this leads to viral fame and ultimately the question, do we reveal who we are? Did we want to let off steam or burn down the patriarchy? Um, it's about power struggles and abuse and is told with riveting narrative and plenty of dark humor. And running off with the dark humor commentary, I grabbed this biography by Caitlin Moran. Um, she, she wrote a book called How to Be a Woman, that's fiction, and then she wrote, this is her biography sort of taking off on that, um, but it is um, an honest, funny take on the life of the modern woman. All right. I don't know how this happened, but death becomes a theme through several of my next books. <laughs> so the next thing you know by Jessica Strasser is a twisty, thought-provoking look at life and death. If you suddenly cannot do the thing you most love to do, is your life over? For singer-songwriter Mason, the answer is yes. He seeks the services of an end-of-life doula for the, ter for the terminally ill, and he's assigned to Nova, who survived a terminal cancer diagnosis. After his passing, the story moves between the past and the present, revealing the love between Mason and Nova, uh, the fact that Mason wasn't really terminally ill, and more, I don't want to give anything away. Um, it all comes together in a bittersweet but comforting conclusion, and Jessica handles the grief and pain with sensitivity. Um, for more bittersweet stories about coping with death, I suggest uh, Second Chance by uh, Jane Green. Um, though this time it is friends who have lost a member of their group. Um, again, sticking with that theme of bittersweet and coping with death, um, my next suggestion is Joanna uh, Trophy's Next of Kin, which in this case it's a family that is coping with the loss of their mom, who was essentially the keystone of that family. All right, into nonfiction. I'm just going to say it one more time. Any of the nonfiction read? We have In Pursuit of Jefferson by Derek Baxter. So this is kind of a mixture between a history book and a travel book. The author, who is a history buff, happened to come across a never published um, travel guide, European travel guide, written by Thomas Jefferson uh, back in the late 1700s. So apparently Jefferson had traveled through Europe as a way to remake himself following the death of his wife and some personal scandal. Um, Baxter, the author, discovered Jefferson's book during his own period of personal crisis and decided to follow Jefferson's lead, using Jefferson's guide to direct his own travels. Uh, so while doing so, he does a lot of reflecting on Jefferson the man and grapples with some of his less noble qualities, in particular his relationship slash participation uh, in slavery. Um, so it's historically detailed, there's some humor, it's heartfelt. Uh, this is his first book. Uh, random fact, he, the author played Jefferson in an elementary school musical. So, <laughs> <laughs> so now, uh, the read alike. so first we have American Sphinx, written by Joseph Ellis. So this is a Jefferson biography, of which there have been many. Uh, Ellis, uh, quote, seeks to uncover the true character of the founding father, unquote. And so this, I picked this biography in particular because it's more in line with that kind of grappling with who he was and his different contradictions. Um, and then, very much in line uh, with In Pursuit of Jefferson, his travels with George by Nathaniel Philbrick. Uh, so he's a, he, Philbrick is an historian. He traces the journey of George Washington that he took to the former colonies when he was a new president. 
So similar in, in the sense of having a first person perspective, you hear the author's thoughts, um, and obviously that same idea of following in the footsteps of a founding father. So reading dangerously is uh, brought to us by Asir Nafisi. Um, she, the subtitle is The Subversive Power of Literature in Troubled Times. This is structured as a series of letters to her father, and this guide to literature as resistance seeks to answer these questions. What is the role of literature in an era when one political party wages continual war on writers and the press? What is the connection between political strife in our daily lives and the way we meet our enemies on the page in fiction? How can literature, through its free exchange, affect politics? So Ms. Nafisi is drawing on her experience as a woman, as a voracious reader, living in the Islamic Republic of Iran, her life as an immigrant in the United States, and her role as literature professor in both countries. She crafts an argument for why we must engage with the enemy and how literature can be a vehicle for doing so. Uh, this, uh, the book includes a resistance reading list. Uh, James Baldwin, Zora Neale Hurston, and Margaret Atwood are all uh, authors that are named on that list. There are many more, too. Um, so as Rita likes, I brought three cups of tea. This is a, um, an, an older selection about a man who goes to Pakistan, and uh, um, he goes to, to climb mountains, and he ends up building schools. So it's pretty, it's true. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a true story. And there's also a follow-up um, to the three cups of tea. And these two are um, Azar Nafisi's previous uh, writings. This one is uh, Reading Lolita in Tehran. I looked at the title for a very long time, and I thought, I don't want to hear about Lolita anywhere. You know, we beat that one to death. But now I think I should read this one. It yeah, sounds very good. Once, good. Really yeah, good. Yeah, once I understood what it was about. And she gets her, gets her friends together, and they read as, as an act of resistance. Uh, read the books they're not supposed to read. And then this is her uh, things I've been silent about. Um, these are her uh, um, memoirs of, of some other things that she wants to talk about as far as being an immigrant and uh, her life in Iran compared to her life in the United States. This one will be available on the 8th of March. Is this the last one? It is, it's the last one. <laughs> well, it's, it's really awesome ending on a positive note. No. I'm glad we have a problem. Okay, so Sandy Hook, An American Tragedy and the Battle for Truth by Elizabeth Williamson. So December 4th, 14th, 2012, Adam Lanza went on a killing spree at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut, killing 26 people, most of whom were children. Uh, after this event took place, a conspiracy theory cropped up claiming that the killings were fabricated as a way to gain support for gun control legislation. So in particular, uh, the author Williamson here takes aim at Alex Jones of InfoWars notoriety for perpetrating this conspiracy theory. Uh, the author then also argues that the same psychology behind the acceptance of that theory that Jones spread is what led to the January 6th protests slash attack at the Capitol. So, uh, Williamson is a New York Times journalist uh, and the book's based on her years of research and interviews. A couple read-alikes, so first we have Newtown, so if you are wanting to read more about the actual what happened that day, this is kind of the first comprehensive account of that tragedy um, and it explores what happened and the psychology of the killer. And then more along the conspiracy theories type thing, we have Republic of Lies by Anna Merlin. Um, the subtitle, which you probably can't see, is American Conspiracy Theorists and Their Surprising Rise to Power. Um, also written by a reporter, again, talking about conspiracy theories in America. Um, it's also brought to mind a recommendation that you 
had last time called uh, Off the Edge, mm -hmm. which is another one if you're interested in that topic of conspiracy theories and the psychology behind their acceptance. We'll work on ending on a higher note for next time. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, this is what we've got coming up for the next several weeks, so we'll hope.